But one of the things that keeps us on the farm and on the ranch is being stubborn. I mean, we don't give up easily, right? Whether it's snow, rain, sleet, hail, cold, warm, whatever, we're stubborn. And we also are creatures of habit. We learn from our parents, we learn from our grandparents. If you happen to be on a farm, you mentioned having, having parents, grandparents there on the ranch, um, you've heard them talk about this is the way we do it, this is the way we've done it for three generations or six generations or whatever. Some of those mindsets are really hard to change when it comes to adopting new technology. And these genomic enhanced EPDs, we still have a number of people who are really good people, really good cattle producers from that standpoint, that just don't embrace those. They don't see the value to them or they don't see the value to their customer. It appears to them as though somebody's come up with this new technology, this new genetic idea, and I'm expected to embrace it. Mm -hmm. And so getting it past that to a new generation and getting them to embrace it uh, is a challenge. And Hey, hey, it's Shay, and you're listening to Casual Cattle Conversations, the podcast for cattle producers to explore new ideas that will help improve their overall management practices. Speaking of improving management, I want to encourage you to take a look at the lineup for the quarter two Rancher Mind events. These laid back Q&A calls are between industry experts and fellow beef producers, and quarter two is all about labor challenges. I mean, we're talking how, when, and where to find the right help, when to integrate new technology onto your operation, and how to become a more efficient manager and leader overall. If you want more information on being a part of these producer-driven conversations, head to the show notes and click the link that'll take you straight to my website. With that, let's hear what our guest has to share with us today. All right, so we are back for part two of the seed stock technology data collection series. And so if you didn't hear part one, be sure to go back and listen to that. That's all about the importance of data collection, some of the challenges seed stock producers face, but we talk about data collection on a small and large scale for all cattle producers, whether you're raising seed stock cattle or um, put yourselves in the commercial cow-calf bucket. But today we're gonna talk about the actual process of collecting data and how to make that more efficient. So we have Ray Williams, Wes Chisholm, and Dr. Clint Rusk. And so we're excited to have them on. Um, Clint is with us from the Charlet Association and Ray and Wes are from the, are from Gallagher. I'm not going to make them all reintroduce themselves twice in one podcast because we are just splitting this episode, but be sure to go back and listen to part one. So just diving right in to data collection. Ray, you have worked with a lot of producers and can you kind of talk about how the data collection process has become so much more efficient today than even five to 10 years ago with the yeah. technology that's available? Well, what's great is the the scale technology today is much different than it used to be and um, much more intuitive and easy to run. Um, you don't have to fuss with a lot of um, uh, a lot of details other than just deciding what you want to know. And um, and then the scales help us get all that information input into it. Um, it used to be just weight and maybe average daily gain, but it's much more than that, right? So we've got traits, activities, and life data um, that we need to get into the system. And then that all becomes part of that original record for that animal throughout its life. And uh, and, and that can be drilled down into reports and and into pieces that you can manage and and look at and make good good decisions on your on your operation. But you know, and, and seed stock producers have a kind of a unique piece as well. And there's so much genetic information that we have to keep track of, and uh, the performance records are just paramount. And understanding how this animal is performing based on, on a set of criteria and uh, based against other animals that I have on my operation, other animals that I'm looking to purchase. Um, so I can really develop the best possible product and, uh, you know, and have that continuance of business while I, you know, produce records and uh, value in those records when I sell my animals, right? 
So, um, and I mentioned, you know, the genetic piece uh, 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 and working closely with associations as well is, is so, so important. And I'm, I'm hopeful that Dr. Rusk will kind of elaborate on that and Wes as well. But um, these EPDs and EP, EBBs, um, say that three times fast, um, you know, to assess that genetic potential of those animals is so important. And um but as I'm working animals, I want to be able to make observations and have the ability to enter it right into my equipment. So I don't have to resort it to memory or write it down on something that's going to get forgotten about, right? And if I'm making decisions about animals that I may have to come back and uh, uh, follow up on, the equipment allows me easily to, to make notes and alerts. So the next time I see that animal, I can really uh, drill down and, and remember what I needed to know about that animal. And um, all the way up to the point of, you know, a uh, situation where I need to get rid of an animal, uh, it's easy to keep track of it and keep moving uh, through my process. So it keeps things efficient. And if I have folks working with me uh, with or that work for us or uh, children or whomever, uh, the systems are easy to learn, right? And they're they're easy to to help them do the same thing. So the standardization of my processes is, is established and everybody is on the same page when it comes to making sure that things are entered correctly. Um, and if they're not, you know, the system helps me align my my information up so it's easy to get back out and make good decisions on that. So yeah, but that's it's we just keep it as simple and basic as possible. But we always ask folks in the beginning, what do you want to know? And then we build it out from there and we help people build systems all over for all kinds of reasons. And, all, and everybody's a little bit different, but there are some major commonalities among seed producers that, seed stock producers that, um, that everybody uses and have become an industry standard now. So with those, you know, you talked about those major commonalities and probably very similar systems that you're putting in place for seed stock producers. Yeah. Can you kind of you know, walk me through, pretend you're on my operation. What does it look like to implement this system and how many um, pieces to the puzzle are there when you talk about a system? Right. So initially what we, we like to do is just go on farm and or ask a lot of questions up front of like, what do you have right now? What system do you currently use? And, um, you know, we there are programs out there and third party programs that people are using now and uh, are really comfortable with, but yet they need more they need more uh, accessibility to enter information at shoot site or, uh, you know, the tactical piece that, 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 you know, I don't want to have to hand type all this stuff in when I get back to the office. So we evaluate that and we understand um, existing equipment against uh, 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 existing cattle handling equipment and, you know, make recommendations as to load bars and, and scale placement and how you're reading EID tags to make sure that we get you what you need there. And um, a numbering system, a good um, uh, visual ID numbering system that doesn't duplicate tags. So you don't have any trouble, uh, the system trying to decipher which animal you've got. You've got an individual animal ID, you've got an EID, but moreover, I can pair up animals. I can pair up um, mama calves or mamas and calves together and uh, and keep that 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 process going so initial records we talk about you know calving records all the way out to uh getting genetic data back from the processor and then putting that back in to see the results of our progress throughout the, the lifespan of that animal um so all of those information data points are just just segmented down into small templates that i can pick and choose when i'm doing that day and apply that to, to my activity that day and um and then we sit down and look at all that. We, we get all this information gathered and we, we break it down and help help producers understand that. And, and they find immediate commonality with the things that they like to look at and go, gosh, that's great. I need a report of that. So we show them how to do it themselves and how to get that information out of the system. And a lot of the information is now being stored on the cloud where they can get it on their devices. A lot of producers that we talk to, I want to do it on my phone. I want to I want to be able to access data if I'm making breeding decisions. I want it right there right now. I don't want to have to run out and try to figure it out at the office or whatever. So accessibility is what we talk about, the ease of input, and then at the end of the day, evaluating the data and helping them see shortcuts to get to the to the results that they're looking for. And um it's it's an awesome process. And 
A lot of them are doing it right now, but this kind of gives them tools of the trade to get it down to the point where they can really do it themselves and feel confident about it and teach others on their operation to do it as well. That's great. So, you know, you, you're collecting all this data. How does that eventually get to the breed association? Like, what does that process yeah. look like? So Wes is um, working um, on some projects right now where we're working with breed associations, you know, in, in the Charlet and um, Hereford and, of course, the Angus Association, where, um, as it is right now, the data comes into uh, a database on the cloud, and you can easily download sessions um, and then import them into the, uh, the breed associations right now. Eventually, what we see is um, a bit of a conduit between where I gather it at shoot side, and then it just, I pick and choose the items that I want to import into the breed association and just hit the button and it goes. That's the whole idea. That's where we're headed. Mm -hmm. So the technology is, we're, you know, we're there. We're, we're really close right now, but right now it is a two-step process where it comes in and goes back out into the breed association or the other third-party process that I've got. But it's all digital. It's not like taking handwritten records nope. and typing them in and then redoing that. It's all digital. Yeah, what used, yeah, and Wes can attest to this too. I mean, what used to take hours to do. Yeah. Days, <laughs> days, days, right? It took days. <laughs> Is now just mere seconds, mere awesome. keystrokes, and they're gone, and they're in where they need to be. So, Clint, let's talk about, you know, what you see with seed stock producers. What are some of the challenges they face when it comes to, getting data sent over and just data collection in general. Is there anything that you see on your end? One of the biggest challenges I think we face, and, and I'm a product of growing up on a ranch with, with grandparents who raise cattle, but one of the things that keeps us on the farm and on the ranch is being stubborn. I mean, we don't give up easily, right? Whether it's snow, rain, sleet, hail, cold, warm, whatever, we're stubborn. And we also are creatures of habit. We learn from our parents. We learn from our grandparents. If you happen to be on a farm, you mentioned having, having parents, grandparents, they're on the ranch. Um, you've heard them talk about, this is the way we do it. This is the way we've done it for three generations or six generations or whatever. Some of those mindsets are really hard to change when it comes to adopting new technology. And these genomic enhanced EPDs, we still have a number of people who are really good people really good cattle producers from that standpoint that just don't embrace those. They don't see the value to them or they don't see the value to their customer. It appears to them as though somebody's come up with this new technology, this new genetic idea, and I'm expected to embrace it. Mm -hmm. And so getting it past that to a new generation and getting them to embrace it uh, is a challenge. And we, we have some really large operations in the Charlet business that have several generations of, of family and that some of the younger ones are starting to embrace and come along, but they've done it the same way for so long, it's hard to change and changing the mindset. That's some of the biggest obstacles I think, Wes, that I've, I've seen us face. Uh, handling the data, they're willing to do that. And, and if you can show them that there's a value to it, to their operation, I think they're willing to embrace, but but getting them to make a change can sometimes be one of the hardest things we do. And it's really challenging to go into those operations, whether you're the youngest member of the family coming back or a salesman coming onto the ranch to make the argument that, well, you guys need to do this different yeah. because it has been a multi-generational operation. They've stayed in business. They've weathered the hardships. They've weathered the storms and they're still there. So it's kind of, you know, that mentality of it's not broke, don't fix it um, becomes a challenge. Um, even to just like to go from writing it on a feed sack mm -hmm. to, you know, collecting it shoot side with a touch screen. Mm -hmm. You know, but, you know, Wes, you said writing it on a feed sack. Well, at one point, there was probably a generation that wasn't writing anything at all as exactly. far as data collection. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm someone who holds family legacy near and dear to my heart, right? I'm right. the fifth generation to be ranching on both sides of my family. You know, both my mom and dad come from strong ranching backgrounds. But when I talk to my grandparents about 
you know, how did they grow up? How did their parents grow up? You know, the pioneers, those founders, they were innovative too. So if we're going to hold on to anything about our legacy, I think we need to remember that yeah, absolutely. there's innovation. The pioneers were innovative. Yes, they were stubborn, but they still had to make changes to survive. Right. And so, they still, yeah, they had success too. I mean, we act like all of a sudden now this new technology is, is, is the only way to be successful, but it's a blend, right? I mean, it's a blend of the old and the new. Um, and the bottom line is, you know, how do I stay competitive? How do, Shay, how do you stay on your family farm and, and keep it viable and operational and, you know, everything that comes with that? So I, I respect the living daylights out of that, that there is there is some legacy that is very, very important to listen to and understand and practice. So when, you know, we're trying to make, you know, change is never easy. I was once told that change is like essentially like going through the five stages of grief when you're making a big change to your business or yeah. in other areas. So what are some questions people can ask themselves or what are some questions you ask producers to help them understand and help it resonate with them that this change is actually going to be what helps keep their operation in business? I think it's one of the things that I've heard over the last couple of years, and it actually ties back into something Dr. Russ talked about in the last podcast is labor, but time saving, labor saving. You know, when you go on to these operations and you go, how can you make this process smoother, faster, better, easier? And I think those are kind of, you know, and then profitable, of mm -hmm. course, at the end of that. I mean, if you take three less people to do the same task, then you're making it less expensive. It's more profitable. And I think that for me, that's been one of the key things is I go talk to producers about new things, new ways to do it, you know, new equipment that we have, you know, something, you know, you'll hear those guys say, well, it used to take me three guys to process a set of incoming calves because I had a guy reading tags, I had a guy writing tags, writing weights. And now we have an EID wand and a scale head I'm running the shoot, the scale head, and the EID wand all by myself. And I'm the one guy at the front of the shoot now. I don't have all the extra hands running around. And I think that's, for me, that's been one of the big takeaways. Yeah. We have people walk up in shows all the time, you know, across the country when we, uh, the big cattle shows. And um, one of the biggest things that they're looking for is, um, I just want my time back. I, I want my life back. I want to be able to to do the things and and that I love to do with my animals, but maybe I'm not physically ready or able to continue that way. And I, I just I'm looking for tools. I'm looking for ways to make this easier for me to be to be better at what I do. And um, those are great conversations that we have with folks. And there's just so many ways that we can help them with that. And um from the record keeping aspect of it to transferring records to gathering records in the field and keeping all the same types of things that they'd like to look at already and just make it a, more of a process that's it's easy to use and easy to input. So for any cattle producer that's out there listening, who's thinking about integrating new technology, new technology of any kind, whether it's yeah. um, EIDs, scales, the load bars, the um, data collection system you just talked about, or if it's a different technology from another company, what, what are some questions they can ask themselves to make sure if it is the right technology, the right time, they're trying to solve the right problem, like, because margins are tight mm -hmm. and these are an investment, an investment that's going to make you more profitable, but it's still, in, it's still money up front. My think, advice to folks, go ahead. I was just going to say, we talk a lot about, um, you know, trying to find the actual pain of the problem, you know, yeah. go down the pain funnel till you find the very bottom of it and what is actually causing the problem. And I think that's what producers, they get stuck up on the, well, I don't have any time to do this, or I don't have any time to do that, but why don't you have time? And they need to drill down and really stop and think what's causing the issue that I need to solve. Um, and I think if they do that, that's when you can say, okay, is it worth my time? Is it worth my money? 
to invest in an issue, to invest in solving this issue. This one is a critical, you know, problem for the ranch that if I do fix, it will return investment. And I think we get hung up sometimes, and I'm as guilty as anybody of getting hung up on, well, this is the problem, but it's really not. That's just the surface level manifestation of it. Yeah, it's it's about starting out simple. You know, you don't have to get it all at once. Um, it's great when some do, but sometimes it's not good. Um, you need to ease into this stuff. And, uh, you know, that's why we make so many different variations of our products, because everybody's in a different walk. Everybody's in a different place in their operation. So they may need just a small element of it, like just a better scale, just to take weights and get average daily gains. Um, some just are struggling with recording basic data. You know, we have processes for that. So it's about listening. It's about making a good decision based on good facts, but not overwhelming people, overwhelming them with things that they're not going to need or are, are going to want, right? It just, just take it easy. We just, we need to take it one step at a time. Clint, I'm curious, do you have any thoughts on how cattle producers can keep a little bit more of an open mind since you're kind of the one who spurred this conversation a few questions ago? <laughs> you know, you, you touched on it earlier, Shay, in my opinion, you, you can't ever stop learning and maybe raise the one that said that you've always has to be a student. We, we all need to be lifelong learners. I, I first heard that at the university and, yeah. and gosh, it's so true. I, I, I hate to admit my age, but I hope even if I live to be 90, like my, my grandfather on my mother's side, I hope I'm still willing to learn and, and to embrace change and embrace better and new and better ways of doing things. And I would hope that even as I get older, if you can show me a return on the investment, if you can show me that there's a reason why I should change, that I would be open to that. Um, I, I think most reasonable people are willing to do that. Um, you know, I'm sitting here thinking about maybe some of the hardest data to collect um, as we think about an aging group of ranchers in the United States, that, that birth weight, um, it's awful tempting to just eyeball it, right? And just drive by and say, yep, that's an 80 pound calf or that's an 85 pound calf. If you actually get out and, and catch that calf and weigh it, that's one of the more difficult pieces of information that we have to gather. And But as I think about bull sales season, Wes has been looking at bulls, I, if, if they don't calve easy, you're probably not getting a return customer. They want them to come to the ground without having a lot of assistance. Some of them have to have some, but they want them, they want the, that idea that it's a sleep all night calving ease bull becomes quite valuable. But if we didn't, if we just eyeball those weights, it's a lot harder to verify and guarantee that that they're that they are going to have that in their genetics. And, right. and, and so we want them to come easy and grow fast. And that's what we're going to be able to document by collecting this data and this information. Um, so it has to be important to you before you're going to do it. That's right. Yeah, that's good stuff. Absolutely. So as we kind of wrap up part two, you guys have really, you've talked about what the technology is, what it looks like to integrate it, and how to really keep an open mind about it. And you've also touched on, you know, we're almost there, you know, it's, it's gotten so much better over the past five to 10 years, but it really is a much simpler process if you open up your minds as far as from the moment you collect that data to getting it sent off to your breed association, or even just being able to analyze it if you're a commercial cow-calf producer and want to analyze it for your own records and seed stock producers. What parting thoughts do you have for the audience out there after you know we've had these conversations in part one and part two about data collection in the beef industry? It's, it's not going to be easy. Um, and we don't, we don't pretend to say that it's going to be easy. Um, it's, it's about making a conscious decision and um, being open to the, the challenge of, of learning a new thing and, um, and taking it in steps. And there's a lot of people who are willing to help and just be there when you need us, you know, be, be there when you need them. And, just learning from each other and 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 re references uh referrals from other people that are doing it really well and and that are in the industry that are working side by side with others 
that have, have been successful at it. And this is their story, right? This is how I did it. And this is what I did. And it works really well for me. And I understand it better now. And it's taken time. It's a learning curve, right? So we don't pretend that it's just overnight you got this. It takes time. But any any effort that you make towards it is going to be worth your time. And we just need to come to the field with facts. This is what it does. This is how it returns. And um, not just hey, look at this shiny new object. It's about return. It's about the return on investment. You know, Shay, one of the things I think about in my lifetime that I've seen a tremendous change has to do with the, the number of, or the percentage of cattle now that are being harvested that grade choice or better. Mm -hmm. Some people talk about upper two thirds of choice. We don't need to get that picky in my opinion, but let's just say they need to grade choice or prime. Right, that's where the money's at in the end part of this game that we that we work at called the cattle business. Those carcasses at grade choice and prime are worth more money. Right. People are willing to pay more for it. Well, we've we have moved the needle. We being all the people along the line that help with data collection, raising cattle, we've moved the needle on this uh, significantly in the last ten years. There's a lot higher percentage of cattle now that are grading in those two upper categories in our quality grading system. Well, you think about back to when we first started gathering that information, marbling is something you can't see. Wes and I can look at a bull for two days and we can't tell how much marbling he has without ultrasounding him, right? Yeah. So we don't want to kill him and open him up. We want to see it with an ultrasound and we want to gather that information so that we can make ultimately that most important change may be the most important one that we're, that we're working on, in my opinion. I, I don't have everybody believing that, but the ranchers, and there's a few of them that started ultrasounding 40 years ago. And I can tell you today, they're not having trouble selling their cattle and they're getting premiums because they selected their females based on the ultrasound, not just their bulls. Right. And because they built those cow herds that are inherently good at, at producing calves with marbling, Consequently, now, as they add a herd bull, they have it on both sides and they're getting paid dividends. Their customers are getting paid dividends. I'm not saying ranching is any easier for them than it was before, but they're not having to deal with, oh, my gosh, how am I going to sell these calves? Because there's a demand for them and a track record. I look at the, the demand that was created just through the, the time period in COVID. People started to really dig into cooking at home right so they yep. started to learn about beef and um they so the demand that 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 clint's talking about is absolutely real and it's going to happen and continue to be that way because people got used to it right um it was the COVID thing was was bad right but at the same time in the beef industry people got savvy and they want it and we've got to step up and be able to make those metrics work and do it profitably because they're willing to pay. Right. Well, there's a lot of things we can do today with technology. We I, we went and talked with some packers and we they're very familiar with trimming carcasses and we believe that we can trim them genetically. And that's the right way to do it is using cattle that take the outside fat off, but leave the taste fat, but take the waste fat off. Yeah. And when we can start doing that genetically, instead of paying somebody to use a knife to do it, uh, we're going to be way ahead. And I really think we're close to that right now. That's what drives me and gets me excited. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you, all three of you, for being on both podcast episodes and taking a lot of time out of your afternoon to visit with myself and create this content for the audience out there who's listening. I'm, I know they'll really appreciate it. And that's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation. Be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day.